Hi everyone, my name is Hanan Majid and I'm from the Rainbow Collective. I'm here with Richard York. Uh, we both run the Rainbow Collective together. We're a documentary production company which primarily focuses on making campaign videos and social justice documentaries, independent and for broadcast. And we've been uh, making pretty much all the campaign against arms trade videos for a few years, like the campaign stuff, as well as the uh, recording and capturing the actions at the DSEI arms fair blockades and protests every two years. We train citizen journalists, and this is our very condensed workshop uh, going through some of the tips that we've found useful, uh, looking at how you can make the most out of using a smartphone and some of the do's and don'ts of making your own campaign video or citizen journalist video. What makes a, a good campaign video? First of all, you, need, you have to know the video's purpose and its audience. What or who is the video for? What do you hope to achieve with it? Answer these questions before you start planning your film. For example, offering practical advice and guidance to activists. Capturing a moment and putting it out for a wider audience who couldn't be there. This could be a, a speech, a picket, a demo or an event. Commenting on international events, crises, conflicts or movements. Educating and informing the general public on an issue. These are just a few examples. Follow the social media of groups and organizations you have interest in. Watch their video content and see how they achieve these goals. So once you know like who your video is for and what its purpose is, like that's the most important thing. This is some kind of general tips to keep in mind when you're planning and executing your video. First off, right, when you're making an independent campaign video or a piece of citizen journalism, it's really important to like kind of link up with partners, collaborate with organizations or groups that share your values, because generally they'll need the support of independent filmmakers and video makers. And also they can help you to kind of reach a, a wider audience as well. They can guide you in terms of distribution. A lot of the time, these organizations, pressure groups, charities, uh, campaigners, they can have their own social media infrastructure that's already kind of up and running. They've already got an audience. And if your views are aligning with theirs, they're usually gonna be really happy to kind of share or repost your work, or possibly even you give them the video file and they upload it on their own channels, but make sure that they, um, make sure they always kind of give you a credit as well. So if you, they can put it up on their Twitter, their Facebook, make sure that it puts your handle on, uh, they get some good content and you get to kind of build your audience and spread the word as well. Try and keep your videos as short as possible. If you go two minutes 20 is what we kind of try and keep as the cutoff point. That means it goes out on Twitter. So there's a whole bunch of video platforms, but Twitter is usually the best one for doing political and campaigning stuff. It's where the biggest audiences are. It's where the most traction is. So two minutes 20 is good. It feels short if you're used to kind of watching longer stuff. But actually, people's attention spans are, are pretty, pretty, pretty short these days. Try and keep your videos consistent, right? Keep practicing, keep producing stuff, but try and build your own style so that when people see it, as well as having your tag on it, they're going to start recognizing the way that you put videos out, develop that style and that identity in your work and build an online network as well. Like try and get uh, influential kind of uh, campaigners on social media, try and get them to follow you and then send them direct messages to let them know that your work is going to be coming out and ask them to share it as a new post. So now we're just going to go through some technical advice on, on filming a campaign video, how you use your phone and how you can get the best out of your phone. So always film in landscape. When I say landscape, I mean film this way. Uh, many people do film this way, like in that's portrait mode. I would say that's not, I, I would say when we're doing campaign videos, film it in this way. Unless I guess if you're doing something that's very specifically gonna go on to your Instagram stories or something like that. Always set your video quality to 1920 by 1080. That's true HD. Some Android phones are set at 720p as standard. Some of the older phones. So you need to go into your camera settings app and change that saying iPhone as standard is set, at, is set at 1920 by 1080. Some of you may want to shoot in 4K, which is great. Uh, it, the only thing we wouldn't recommend it just because you might not have the space. It takes up a lot of space, but if you have, go for it. 
If your phone has the option to shoot in 1920 by 1080 at 50, 50 or 60 frames per second, use this because it allows true slow-mo in the edit. So when you're actually filming clips, make sure at an absolute minimum, you're filming at least 20 seconds. So 20 seconds might, when you're filming might seem like a lot of time and you think, usually a lot of people make this mistake, they'll film something after five seconds, they think, damn, we got it. But the reality is, is when you're filming something, by the time that you've set up, by the time you've got yourself steady, you're gonna see within that 20 seconds, probably only probably about five seconds is usable. So when you're sending your clips, so you filmed everything, you're gonna send your clips. Send it by WeTransfer, that's the go-to software that we use. WeTransfer is a brilliant service. Google Drive's great. Sometimes you can use email, but it might have like a, a 50 megabyte limit. Do not make the mistake of sending your clip to buy a WhatsApp. WhatsApp always compresses your file. So if you're sending something which is a 100 megabyte file, it will compress it down to probably about 10 megabytes and you will lose loads of quality and you will be able to tell that quality in the sound and the picture. So it, if you just wanna send shots to colleagues just to say, this is something that I got, you can send it by WhatsApp, but when you're sending it for the edit, you have to send it by WeTransfer. Connect your phone to your computer and then send it. Or you can send it directly from your phone if you've got the WeTransfer app or Google Drive. And finally, always back up your shots immediately. So if you've been on a demo, if you've covered a, if you, if you've covered an, an action or anything like that, as soon as you get back, back up, back up your, uh, your images, back up your pictures onto a computer or use whatever cloud, whatever cloud uh, account that you've got, whether it's iCloud or Dropbox or any of these. So that's the kind of basic advice for if you're going out on location and shooting. But like what we've all found uh, over the last year and a half, because everything's been disrupted, there's been a lot less uh, opportunity to go out and film stuff on location due to the pandemic. We found that we've <laughs> been using uh, a lot more kind of uh, found footage to build videos out of, right? Like footage that we've ripped from YouTube, uh, footage we've found from news channels, archive, right? So instead of going out and shooting stuff, we're actually bringing together existing footage and then mixing that, matching it with text or with voiceover. So it's not really something we did a lot of before. We started doing it more because of the pandemic. And now we've realized it is actually a really effective way of putting videos together uh, really quickly, especially stuff that might be happening abroad where you can't get over and shoot it, but you want to put the word out. You can just grab the stuff that people are shooting. If it's like a campaigner, um, make sure you're crediting them as well, especially if it's a citizen journalist you know, in Palestine or whatever, who's uh, been out there on the ground filming and they've been putting themselves at risk, make sure you're gonna, you're gonna credit them uh, if you're gonna take the footage and get in touch with them if you can. Right, when you're getting your footage from online, there's a whole bunch of ways of ripping it, but a lot of the ones which are online, right, use an online one, don't use uh, a software that you download, there's a lot of them around. There's one that you should use, right, which is 4K video downloader. We're gonna put the link in the description. Right, that's the only one that you should use. A lot of them pop up. If you Google for YouTube Ripper, right, a lot of the services have got kind of spyware on them. A lot of them are really dodgy. Uh, a lot of them, it's not worth us putting the links up because they get taken down. So even though it's actually not illegal to download the stuff from YouTube, sometimes they're violating rights and stuff. So their services come, get pulled down. The reliable one, which gives you good quality, and it's always there, it's called 4K Video Downloader. And keep it updated. If you let your version expire, it's free, but if you let the version expire, um, sometimes it won't be able to download your YouTube link. It's super easy and intuitive. Uh, so yeah, the link is gonna be in the description. Uh, when you're downloading it, always make sure you're ripping it at the highest available quality. And uh, 4K Video Downloader, if it's an HD video, if it's 1080p, it's gonna give you that option. So use the highest quality. When you're looking around for stuff as well, don't just take the first video that you get and don't just stick to like one video and rip loads of bits out of it, right? Find loads of different videos because you're gonna get deg degradation of quality because you're ripping it from online sources. But the more different places you've got it from, the more it looks like a kind of a montage and a patchwork and that kind of varying types of image quality, it actually works in your favor. 
so it's not everything's like 480 it's not everything's 10 8 it can like it, it, it can be a patchwork but that it makes it look it makes it look good in the end it makes it look like you've brought all these different elements together um experiment with your text right a lot of these videos can look good if you're just putting text up there uh but don't fall down the trap using like fancy fonts and stuff right don't mix multiple fonts in one video find something that's like really clean really clean really easy to read don't put wacky colors in there don't put like really stylized fonts because you might think it looks good but actually like when people watch it it looks dead amateur it doesn't look professional when you've got kind of curly fonts and stuff in there finally with these right you, if you're doing a text-based video you're going to need music and we're going to talk about like fair use uh in a few minutes uh, that's how we get around the legality of uh, ripping video and putting it into a new campaign film. Music, though, you can't mess around with that. Music and stills, uh, the copyright is you're going to you're going to get your videos taken down off YouTube. You're going to get strikes put against your account if you're using copyright music. So find copyright free music. There's tons of it on YouTube. Young composers who are putting stuff out and they just want filmmakers to use it or um, collaborate try and find some musicians to work with and then they can make some stuff that's tailored for your for your thing don't use commercial music because you're just going to get your video taken down uh richard i'm just going to add a couple of things to that i think there's two places that i would say which are brilliant for library footage and uh we've used we've used them a lot we released a black lives matter video uh, with the london cat team and we used a website called motion array where you were able to get loads of library footage you have to pay for it but I thought it was a service that kind of paid for itself once you'd once you start using it another free service is called Pexels so we'll we'll put the link we'll put the link in the description but these these two are really good to use so how do we navigate as citizen journalists during time of COVID so, so here here are a few things that we thought uh, work for us and we thought would and we've been recommending to our, to our citizen journalists so although restrictions are now being lifted, further waves can't be ruled out. And we, and we can expect the government to cherry pick examples of when to restrict the rights to protest for public health. So when you do attend a rally or a demo, make sure you are mindful of others, wear a mask and keep your distance. Respecting space should always be a priority when creating content and is even more essential during a pandemic. Be aware of new police powers. Within, within the year, police will be, will be able to arrest protesters, journalists, and photographers when they, de when they are deemed to be causing an annoyance or public nuisance. Bring backup, work as a pair, where possible. And if you have trouble with police, have your partner record any encounters using the Stopwatch app. Uh, you know, we, me and Richard, we've been, uh, we've been running this company for over 15 years now. Whenever we do any, any actions, especially during pre-pandemic times, we were always doing it together. But even if we, during pandemic times, even if we are on our, if, we're, if we can't do it together, generally Richard will have his partner and she will go with him or I will have someone to go with. If you can do work in pairs when you're doing this, when you're doing covering demos and you're covering uh, demos, rallies, actions, anything like that. Or even if it's, you talk with the organizers. So if you're working with, so when we're doing stuff with CAT, you know, I will always be in communication with someone at the CAT team. And if anything goes wrong, I will have a number that I will just be able to contact. So keep those things in mind. Uh, just another thing, even if you don't work as a professional journalist, journalist consider joining NUJ to, to get a press card. This can come in, this can be really useful to avoid arrest or intimidation from the police. And whatever, ha whatever happens, be careful throughout. Uh, throughout, throughout 2020 and 2021, police have started to arrest accredited journalists at demos. I think the environment that we're in when it comes to, when it comes to things like uh, demos and actions and things like this, police are getting more harsh. So always make sure, not just the backup, make sure you're, you're being wise with, the, with, all of, with all of your actions. Make sure if, if you need to record anything, if you need to record anything that's happening to you, do that. Make sure you've got the bus cards and you've got the numbers in, on, in your phone or on a piece of paper that if anything happens, you've got, people, you've got people to call. Let your family members or your friends know where you're going and how long you will be. Let someone know what you're doing and where you're gonna be. 
So that's some practical advice, right, about navigating safely the times we're in, partly in terms of COVID and partly in terms of the new police powers and the, the risk that you might be at from, from police when you're out and about shooting at demos. Now, here's some creative responses that we've found to working during the pandemic as well, right? We've had to be uh, based more in the edit suite than out on the street, but how do we creatively make that work for us? So first off, make the most of fair use policy to create videos when you can't go out and film in person. Now, fair use is a, a legal uh, instrument, I guess, or a mechanism by which uh, you can use footage which other people have shot, other organizations have shot, um, but you can legally restructure it and like reconstitute it into uh, new films. Um, uh, there's a few things, right? One of them is you've got to keep it short. So if it's even if it's a five minute video, just use a few seconds of it. Uh, that works in your favor for fair use. Second thing is, is your video public interest? Right. If you can argue that it's something the public needs to know about, you have the right to rip bits out of someone else's film and use it in the in the public interest. If it's not making a profit, like most of our citizen journalism work is not going to be making a profit. It's not a commercial piece. And therefore, that works in our favor in terms of fair use. And uh, finally, are you changing the purpose of the video? So, for example, uh, if something, a piece of footage which was originally used by a news company, a news broadcaster as part of a news bulletin, and uh, I'm repackaging it as a campaign video, I'm fundamentally changing the, the, the purpose and the aim of that video. And that's the main thing that works in our favor with fair use. So just to recap, uh, keep it short, make sure it's public interest, make sure it's nonprofit, and make sure that whatever you're ripping, uh, you're changing the purpose i.e. don't rip someone else's campaign video for your own campaign video, right? Then you're ripping it off. Uh, make the most of filming in Zoom. So see online interviews as an asset rather than a barrier. It's now just as easy to interview someone on the other side of the world as it is someone in your own city. So what you lose in technical quality, you can actually make up for in international scope of your productions, uh, which can really, it can give something some real production value when you're getting uh, speakers and interviewees from around the world. Uh, use screen recording software on your computer to ensure the maximum quality. Uh, of your Zoom call, is, you don't really want to rely on just uh, using the Zoom recorder if it's for a high-end uh, piece because you can lose quality. And if possible, uh, get people to record their audio separately on their phone and send it to you afterwards. That's how you get the maximum quality. If that's not possible, don't worry about it. Audience expectations of video and sound quality are pretty lenient at the moment because everyone's got used to watching stuff that's been recorded on Zoom. Uh, use the same rules when you're shooting a Zoom interview than when you're filming a location, right? I like I'm here, little tiny bit of headroom. Uh, try not to have the camera like looking up people's nose. Quite often people naturally, they're gonna be like this when they're on Zoom, right? is because it's wherever they've plonked their laptop down, doesn't really look like a proper documentary. It looks like someone's doing it on their phone. So eye level, little bit of headroom, preferably something in the background that shows uh, the location that they're in that speaks something about their, about their character or their environment. Great, so we're gonna talk a little bit about once you've captured everything now, what do you, what do, you do with it? So when it comes to editing, uh, I would say there's, uh, there's quite a few things to keep in mind. So just remember this, uh, filmmaking is a collaborative process. If you know, if you know any, any, any editors, then I would suggest linking up with them to collaborate. Likewise, work with musicians, designers, and artists to add layers of professionalism and quality to your work. Whether you're using your own footage or rip footage, make sure you use lots of different shots. Try to keep shots to a maximum of five to six seconds and shoot or download about three times more than you think you will need. So generally, if I'm downloading, if I'm using, uh, we're making a film and we're going to be using footage that is, that's going to be from, you know, uh, uh, library footage or, old, or, or footage from YouTube, I'll spend the best part of a day just going through the script or going through the interview and then picking out, making notes and picking out what type of footage that we need. And then just go and spend spend good few hours going through YouTube, uh, Vimeo or anything like that 
trying to find the video, uh, trying to find the video materials. If you have a relatively powerful desktop or laptop, download DaVinci Resolve. It's an industry standard editing platform, which is free to download and, and to use. It's, easy, it's easily as good as the most expensive platforms like Adobe Premiere Pro, and many industry professionals are already making the making them move. Uh, yet I would hi highly recommend DaVinci Resolve. We've been telling most of our students to, to start using this. It's a brilliant piece of software. Uh, so use YouTube to take a, to take a full free course in editing. There are some amazing channels which offer full courses from the most basic techniques to the final to final to the final touches and mixing of feature films. See the links in the description for good tutorial channels. And so finally, if you're editing on the go and you or you don't have a, com a suitable computer, download Keymaster or Adobe Clip for uh, for iPhone, or you can use uh, I think it's Adobe Premiere Rush which uh, uh, again, I think the Adobe stuff might cost a bit of money and Keymaster, I think is a one-off one -off fee, but, uh, but, they're, but they're brilliant. I, the, other, the other one that you can use is iMovie, which comes standard with your iPhone. Uh, you can do some basic editing on that. And I've used that on quite a few occasions when I've been doing stuff with Campaign Against the Arms Trade, just to get stuff out really quickly. So any, any of those will do the job. Yeah, and really make the most of the free resources. Like me and Hanan studied at film school for years. And that was like before you had like all this YouTube stuff. It's like the, the workshops are just amazing. You can do the equivalent of a of a whole film school course using that stuff. Um, so right, just to recap the final thoughts, um, collaborate wherever you can. That's with uh, other artists, filmmakers and organizations. Keep shooting and editing as many videos as you can. You're gonna get faster and more skilled with each project. Have a clear idea of what you want to achieve with your video and who your audience is before you start shooting. Make the most of the cheap accessible technology and the resources and the workshops that you can find online. Stay safe in terms of COVID and in terms of uh, the police and security and be respectful. The most important always is be respectful to the people who you're filming with. So yeah, we hope that's useful. It's like a super condensed version of our workshops, but you can uh, follow us on social media and also through Campaign Against the Arms Trade. We regularly do uh, longer workshops where we elaborate on some of these points, but for now, hope that's useful.